In this video, we're going to discuss a little bit about fluid resistance. Now, by a fluid, we could mean either a liquid or a gas. They can both be modeled as fluids. So this is discussion about the air resistance we've been ignoring all semester. And you're going to see why in an intro physics course we ignore that concept. All right, so let's define it first. It is a force due to a fluid, fluid can be a liquid or a gas, as I said before, on a moving object. And just like friction, it tends to be in the opposite direction of the movement of the object. So it is a resistive force, it's resisting the motion of the object. So if your object is falling, you're going to have a force due to gravity acting downward and the fluid resistance is going to act upward, which is going to affect the force, the acceleration and the change in speed of that particular object. Now let's get into why we don't typically talk in too much detail about this in this course. And that's how we actually calculate the fluid resistance. So there are two different equations actually. There's one for low speed. So our force due to the fluid is gonna equal a constant times velocity. And for high speed, We're going to have a distant, different constant, and it now goes as velocity squared. So there are two complications to these formulas. We have these constants, k and d, and k and d depend upon a lot of factors. Uh, the size and shape of the object, and the density of the fluid. So if you do a little bit of Googling, you can find some formulas in order to be able to calculate these based upon the size and shape of your object, the density of the fluid. So it's for each situation, that constant is going to be different, which is what makes it so complicated. You would have to figure out what K and D are for each individual problem. It's not like when I give you a coefficient of friction where I can say, okay, it's wood and it's steel, this is what the coefficient of friction is. The other problem with this is that these forces are not a constant because as the object falls through the air, we learned earlier in the semester when we talked about free fall, the velocity changes and it's going to change what the value of the force due to the fluid is. So this means we're really dealing with a function here rather than an algebraic expression that we can just plug numbers into and get an answer from. It's gonna change based upon what point in the motion you're in. All right, so let's explore a little bit more this concept of the fact that the fluid force changes as the velocity of the object changes. So let's look at an object just falling through the air. So if we do a free body diagram, you would have the force due to gravity downward and the fluid force opposing that downward motion. So if the velocity or object was in this direction, our fluid force is gonna go upward. So if we sum forces here, we're gonna have our fluid force minus the force due to gravity equaling mass times acceleration in the y direction. So now let's pretend this is a low speed situation. So we're just gonna deal with our constant K times V minus M times G equals mass times acceleration in the Y. All right, so let's understand what's going on here. When you start out, so you drop the object from rest, this term here is gonna be small, which means that the fluid force is gonna be less than F of G, 
So you're going to have a net force in the negative y direction. But as the object falls, the velocity is going to increase in magnitude. It's going to increase in the negative direction, but the magnitude still gets bigger. And as the velocity increases, the fluid force, or air resistance, increases. Because any constant times a number that's growing is a growing number. So what's going to happen is that as this term here gets bigger and bigger, the net force in the negative y direction decreases. And it's going to decrease until the net force in the negative y or the net force in the y direction period equals zero. And remember, when the net force is zero, so remember net force in the y direction is going to equal mass times acceleration in the y. So when this is zero, mass is not zero. The, the object is still there. It's still present. It still has mass. So that must make this term, the acceleration in the y direction, zero. And when you're no longer accelerating, your change of velocity equals zero. So the velocity becomes constant. And this is what we refer to as terminal speed. So as an object falls through a fluid, there is a maximum speed it can increase to. And it can increase to a speed up to the point where that speed makes the fluid force equal to the force due to gravity. So we would take our Newton's second law, so kV minus mg equals mass times zero now. So our constant times velocity is going to equal mass times the gravitational field strength, or v is going to equal mass times the gravitational field strength divided by our constant k. And this is the equation we use for terminal speed. We can do the same thing with our high speed situation and end up with a relationship that looks like this. Let me make that M a little bit more clearly in M. So this is the max speed an object can reach when it's falling through a fluid. And what that speed actually is is going to depend upon the mass of the object as well as the shape of the object as well as the fluid it's falling through. So this is why it's so hard to have something break the sound barrier because someone tried this, they tried jumping very high in the atmosphere, but there is a point where they reach terminal speed. So they have to fall long enough and that terminal speed is going to change and the speed of sound is going to change based upon the temperature and pressure of the fluid. So it's a very complex situation trying to fall through the atmosphere and break the sound barrier because of those changing dynamics. So this is one of the reasons why we don't deal too much with this concretely because what the constants are are complicated and the force is not really a value you can just plug in because as the object falls what that force is changes. So let's look at this in a graphical concept. All right, so I've drawn three graphs here. We have acceleration versus time, velocity versus time, and position versus time. And what I've drawn is the relationship that you would see whenever we ignore air resistance. 
So as an object falls through the air, you expect the acceleration to equal a negative 9.8 meters per second squared. There might be some variation here, even when you're ignoring air resistance, but we haven't talked about that yet this semester. And then we have a linear relationship of velocity versus time when the acceleration is constant, because remember, you're looking at this relationship here. So since time is to the first power, you expect the slope to be the acceleration, and since the acceleration is constant, it's linear. And then for position versus time, you expect a parabolic relationship, looking at the equation delta d equals bit plus one-half a t squared. So you expect a parabolic relationship because you have a t over here to the second power. All right, so what happens when we introduce and discuss air resistance? So I'm going to switch to green now. And remember, as the fluid force increases, because you're going from a situation like this to a situation here where we have an additional force, Remember, this force is increasing, which is going to then decrease your, negative, your acceleration in the negative y direction, because you're decreasing your net force as this first term over here gets larger. That's going to cause your acceleration then to decrease to zero over time. And the actual shape of this curve is going to depend upon whether you're dealing with low speed or high speed. I drew it a little curvy, like it was the um, high speed one. And so what that's going to do to your velocity over time, where it's going to start out linear, but as the acceleration decreases with time, your change in velocity is going to decrease and eventually it's going to level out until you hit this level where you're at terminal speed. And then with position versus time, you're going to start out once again parabolic, but then as you start hitting the terminal speed, it's going to go to a linear relationship. Because when acceleration equals zero, our relationship loses that second term. So as this goes to zero, you lose that second term with the t squared and it becomes a linear relationship. So you see this change over from being parabolic relationship to being a linear relationship. So you can see here, ignoring air resistance makes our lives a lot easier. And for larger, heavier objects, like we did Lab 103, where we drop the ball, over that short distance, that really isn't going to change what our results are that much. And we probably, hopefully, all saw fairly low percent errors when we did that lab. But when you're dealing with something falling through the air on something that is like a parachute that has... A, the fluid re resistance is going to be different than for a spherical shaped object where the air can flow around it, then you're going to see a larger effect and you're going to reach something like terminal speed.